welcome one and all. It's time for another spicy, tender battle report in the old world. This time, my dwarves take on the vile, evil, despicable, barely painted forces of Rob the Honest Wargamer. 2,000 points, and this took place shortly before a tournament, so as I'm only a few games into the old world, I thought I'll try out some different dwarf units, try some different combos, leave out some things that I consider to be strong, potentially, uh, just to see how the alternatives do before going to a tournament, trying to make a list for that event. So, let's have a look. And you can see immediately that there are a couple of war machines there. I don't have any cannons, don't have any organ guns. I do have a bolt thrower, and I do have a grudge thrower with an engineer perched between them there. Now, the, the main difference between this list and the other lists I've been running so far is that I do not have the Anvil of Doom. Some people consider it an auto-include, some think it's very expensive. We've got Miles in the chat, good evening. So, now by the way, there are going to be probably some rules played incorrectly in this game. I know at least one, and in fact I just finished playing in a tournament and I definitely got some rules wrong in that as well. I'm going to be reporting on that at some point soon as well probably tomorrow evening, and yes, this is, Ben, this is the old classic grudge thrower, but you may notice if you look carefully here, the back beam there is actually just made out of green stuff, because the one I bought, I bought it on eBay, probably about 15 years ago or so, and it didn't have that piece, so I just made one out of green stuff, slapped it on there, and then put a, like, a Bugman beer mug on there as well. So you can't really tell, because it's right at the back anyway. So, no anvil. So what am I going to do about spell countering, dispelling? I'm going to bring a rune lord, so you can see him in that unit there. And he obviously has a bit more mobility than an anvil, i.e. he can move at least an inch, so that's faster than an anvil. But he does also have six inches less on his range for dispelling. So, the potential issue is that even though you've got mobility, you can get around the table a bit, how far are you really going to move as a rune lord in a dwarf combat unit over the course of the game? And is that going to give you sufficiently longer range than an anvil? These are the things going through my head while making the list. We shall see. And then to give him a little bit of a boost, because the rune lord only has plus two to dispel, I've also given him a... Master Rune of Balance, which means that I can do a three dice dispel each turn, one that is, and Rune of Spellbreaking, which is an auto dispel, one use only, and then it's gone. So that is the Rune Lord. There is also a King in this list who is also in this Iron Breaker unit on the other corner, and he is kitted out to survive. So he's got Rune of Parrying, minus one to hit against him, Master Rune of Gromril, two plus save, and the Rune of Preservation, so he's immune to Killing Blow and that kind of thing. We've got the engineer I told you about as the character as well, and there's also a BSB who's in the hammerers there, the Thane. So you generally want a Thane or a King in the hammerer unit because it allows one of their most interesting special rules to be used, which is that any hammerer can issue or accept challenges. So if you're fighting a gigantic monster, for example, and you just repeatedly issue challenges with one hammerer, it's very unlikely they'll actually beat you in combat sufficiently to make you run away, because the overkill has limits, and if you've already got a BSB and a banner in there, there are other ways you can build up your static combat resolution as well. So you can tie up big expensive monsters for a long time using a unit like this, just feeding them one hammerer each turn. And those are the heroes. We've got lots of small shooting units in this list as well. So we've got one unit of Iron Drakes there with a Trollhammer Torpedo. We have got eight Thunderers, and all my shooter units generally have the champion upgrade. There are some Quarrelers around as well. You can see five just standard Dwarf Warriors there. They're just going to be a bit of a screen, and hopefully stop my more important things getting charged when I don't want them to. The Oh yeah, the BSB has a Runic Standard. So he's got the Master Rune of Grugni, which is 5 plus ward save for the unit he's in, and 6 plus ward save in the shooting phase for surrounding units as well, so anyone within 6 inches of the model. 
then. Hello. Yes, the chat is filling up nicely down there. So if anyone's got any comments or spots any rules errors, then let me know immediately. So nice ward save on the hammerers, which kind of makes up for the fact that they don't really have much armor. It's only heavy armor, which is feeble. And I think you can get them shields. That would only protect them against shooting, though. So then the standard bearer in the hammerer unit as well also has a runic standard. So that one has... Uh, the Master Rune of Hesitation. So when you charge them, you don't get any special rules for charging. So no using lances, no impact hits, no special attacks that you gain through charging, but you do still get your initiative bonus. And they still count as being charged, so they still get two attacks each when you charge them. So that's spicy, obviously, and they're drilled as well, so they can change their formation before moving, which includes charging. So if they need to charge through a small gap, they can shrink down a bit, and if they're in a big open area and they want a really wide frontage to get a huge fighting rank then they can do that as well before charging. There is a gyrocopter behind a small unit, small shooter unit, which is eight quarrelers or maybe nine. I think that one's eight and the nine is on the other side. So if we go back to this side, there's the nine quarrelers. We've got John and we've got Dom in the chat. Dom also doing dwarves apparently. Good, I'm sure your dwarves won't be as old school as these ones with goblin green bases. So you're definitely a few points down from the start, so you've got work to do. Unless, I apologise if you are going goblin green bases, by the way. So two small units of quarrelers. The thinking is, if there are enemy chaff units, if you've all you've got is one massive shooting unit, then you can't really split your fire up. So, what? You do have goblin green bases. Wild. But there's actually a goblin green shortage at the moment. The game colour goblin green from Vallejo has been sold out everywhere I've tried. So, I'm really looking for one of those because I need to get more movement trays painted. And hopefully I'll be able to get my hands on it before the next wave of dwarves is... Or the first wave, should I say, of dwarves is released because I'll be obviously painting their bases as well. However, are they goblin green with official, authentic 90s Citadel green flock on them as well. How about that? Then we've got some rangers, and you can see that despite the fact that they can scout, I've actually just put them out on this flank in a long line, and there are 12 of them, and they have all the upgrades, so they've got shields, they've got great weapons, and they have crossbows. So, what are we looking at here? Now, I told you this army was barely painted, and I thought... Do I want to sully the reputation of this channel by putting these undercoated and freshly printed Chaos Warriors on it? And I thought, you know what, it's against Rob, so I can slap his face on the thumbnail, and that's probably going to get at least like five extra views. So I think it's worth it to sully the reputation, just drag this channel through the mud, unpainted filth all over it, I think that's fine. So, the evil, vile, disgusting forces of Chaos. We have some Chaos Warriors. I think all the, the infantry ones are chosen, so they're small units. It is multiple small units. So we've got a unit of Chaos Warriors there. We have got some Chaos Ogres here. We've got a Dragon Ogre. We have got more Chosen. We have got Warhounds. We've got more Chaos Ogres. We've got more Dragon Ogres with a Sorcerer with the Demonic Steed. So some... Smallish units, but some of them quite significantly hard hitting. Got more Chaos Warriors, got more Chaos Ogres, got more Warhounds, and we've got a Demon Prince. So these things are generally the bane of my existence. Anything that flies that's really difficult to kill is a challenge for a dwarf gunline nowadays. It used to be. That would be what you wanted to see on the other side, because you would just fire a couple of cannons and kill it in the first turn. Anytime you're facing anything with a big model, back in the old days of Warhammer. So, for example, you're facing Undead, you see a Terrorgeist, cannon it off in the first turn. That's what you want. But now, cannons are significantly less potent. There's way less damage that they do. And the big flyers are reigning supreme at the moment. So the Demon Prince, pretty scary. And with it rolling on the... the is it even called the Eye of the Gods? I think it is. Then they can actually become even better over the course of the game as well. And they also have an item they can take that allows you to re-roll that. So if you happen to roll a 1, which is they gain stupidity, you can re-roll it. So, 
There are my rangers staring down their foes. And a little bit of a frontal view of my army here. Look at that. Lovely Iron Drakes. And what is my game plan here? So, the Bolt Thrower is probably my best chance at doing any wounds at all to the Demon Prince, because it's got very high strength. And it does two damage, so that's actually a good start on it. And the Grudge Thrower, if I could land a direct hit on the Demon Prince would obviously be good, but that's slightly unlikely, so I'm going to try probably to fling that at things it's likely to hurt. So if I can center the hole directly over a Chaos Ogre, for example, that would be very nice. The Hammerers. I don't know whether the Chaos would really like to engage with the Hammerers, because they're very scary. So, I believe these are the pre-game Vanguard moves now, so the Warhounds are steaming right up there, in the middle and on the left flank. And my Vanguard move, I move the Gyrocopter up alongside the Rangers. So I don't know if I mentioned my Gyrocopter's weaponry, so I've given it the Clatter Guns, and the reason for that, that I find that interesting, is that it can march, so it can move 18 inches, and then still fire its guns. So it does have minus one to hit because it is a... It's a multi-shot gun, so it's not going to hit very often, but that's still kind of cool, marching 18 inches and still being able to shoot. What's the Demon Prince got? Well, the Demon Prince has the following spells. So, Pillar of Fire. Now, any time I see a Vortex, I'm thinking, oh dear, that's going to block my lines of sight for shooting. But this one actually does some decent damage as well. D3 plus 3, Strength 3 hits, AP of minus 2 for anyone it touches. And it can move. Uh, you can move it in a, a direction you want, basically, D6 inches. So you can have it keep bouncing over the same unit back and forth. And one thing I learned is that if you have multiple Vortexes cast on the table, that it's currently being ruled that they can't stand on top of each other, Vortexes, so they would bounce through each other and bounce to the other side of things, which can give them extra distance, which is a really interesting concept. So if you've got lots of vortexes and cast them all in a row, they can like bounce over each other and achieve a huge uh, range on them. There's a lot of weirdness in this game, by the way. The tournament I just played in, when I report on that, you'll see some really weird situations that it's unknown whether the rules writers intended them to work the way they do in the game, but we'll get to those another time. Arcane Urgency, which allows the unit to move, so similar to the Anvil of Doom's rule, or the Anvil of Doom's, one of its uh, bound spells. The Curse of Cowardly Flight, so this doesn't sound too terrifying for dwarves, because it, they have to make a panic test, and if they fail, they just run away. And if they pass, then they give ground. So it can make the enemy just move back a little bit, and seeing a panic test on leadership 9 or 10 isn't that terrifying. Then, we have on the Sorcerer, on the Demonic Mount, we have Fireball, which is self-explanatory, just a magic missile. Pillar of Fire, again, which is the same Vortex, and Oaken Shield, which is a 5 plus ward save that you can put on your units. So my Rune Lord, despite being a Rune Lord, he's only considered level 2, so he can only dispel within 18 inches. Which means if those wizards stay more than 18 away from him, then they can just cast spells willy-nilly, fling spells everywhere, and there's nothing he can do about it. So, Chaos are getting the first turn. So, Oaken Shield is cast onto the Dragon Ogres. And the Warhounds have moved right up into the face of the Quarrelers, so they're going to have to shoot them. And they're really just screening the other units, because you've got Chaos Ogres and Warriors coming up behind them. They don't want to be peppered with too many shots. And... Yeah, so a nice little screen. Demon Prince moving up behind them. They're staying outside of charge range of all my units, of course, at this stage. Because dwarves can only... Their maximum charge would be 9 inches. So these are actually staying out of 9 as well. That dice is representing, I think, the maximum charge of the dwarves. Action shot of the bolt thrower there, looking down the silhouette of the Demon Prince. Are the Chaos Ogres moving up as well. They don't want to be charged by the rangers, because 12 of them with great weapons is actually of quite a scary prospect in combat. Especially if they're charging, so they wouldn't necessarily go last. It depends on the initiative of who they've just charged. So you'd really want to hit them first, and they're going last, and hopefully you'll wipe them out. Because their armor isn't that great, especially if they're using their great weapons. So, 
single dragon ogre there in the centre, backed up by more warriors. Now, they're not very fast, any of these, particularly, apart from the warhounds and the demon prince. So, they're not fully up in my face yet. So, I'm going to get a good turn of shooting into them. And you'll see that there are no vortexes currently in play. Is that about to change? We shall see. So Arcane Urgency allows the Chaos Ogres to move up a bit faster. So they're staying behind the Doggos though. And some more casting. So they actually cause a couple of wounds. I think it's a fireball on these Dwarf Warriors. And they fail their panic test and run away. That's unfortunate, isn't it? So they were here and they've gone. So I've lost one of my screens, which isn't very nice. And you can see a Vortex has been placed down right here in front of uh, these... So those are the warriors. That's another unit of warriors there. So yes, I've got two units of dwarf warriors. I don't know if I mentioned that when I was going through the list. But this one has a vortex in front of it. So because vortexes can't land there because there's not enough space. Whenever this moves, it can bounce all the way through both units and then back again. Let's see. Mike says, so great. You're still doing battle reports. Been following since 2016, the early AOS days. Awesome. Yes, I have been doing a vast amount of battle reports over the last few years. Uh, the last... How long has it been? About a, a solid couple of years of Age of Sigmar and plenty of Kings of War in that time as well and Dead Zone in particular and now Old World is getting into the mix. I did used to do battle reports for 8th edition Warhammer and Bolt Action and Drop Zone Commander and Relics. Went to quite a few Relics tournaments back in the day. That's coming back by the way. That's going to be interesting. A TT Combat who bought it years ago finally bringing it back. So plenty of game systems on this channel over the years, and plenty right now that's keeping me very busy. Thankfully, managing to keep all the rules separate in my mind. Got them all in different compartments, so not getting them all mixed up. I do have two Kings of War tournaments coming up next week. One on the Saturday, one on the Sunday. And then there's more Old World later in the month as well. So don't want to get those mixed up. Now, there's Rob posing, but then he cancels his pose too early. And I decide, you know what, I'm not taking another picture. Why should I? If you can't hold a pose for long enough, if you're not professional, this is what you get. So we get the blurry, kind of half-blinking face, and he's just going to have to deal with it. On to the Dwarf turn one. So I'm going to unleash some shooting supremacy now. But first of all, the Vortex moves through my unit and kills a couple of Iron Breakers, which is sad. And a couple of Warriors as well, but they don't run away. And my... The movement, I do move up this little screen up there. The Iron Breakers move away from the Vortex a bit, so hopefully it doesn't catch up with them. And then I'm going to unload some shots. So what can I do? I've got all these crossbows, all these crossbows, guns, Iron Drakes. So you'll see that I've killed a Chaos Ogre on this side. That was from the Rangers. So I prioritised the Chaos Ogres because I felt like if I kill one of them, that's actually a significant downgrade in their damage output. If I kill, like, two Chaos Warriors, they're from the back rank, so it doesn't really affect them too much when they get to combat. So I thought killing whole Ogres is probably a better bet, and I'm more likely to be able to finish off that unit later. I've put some shooting damage from the Thunderers into this single Dragon Ogre as well, so he's got one wound left, I think. And shoot up some Warhounds with the Quarrelers, who then flee past the Warriors, and... Yeah, so the screen is gone, but it's done its job. It's protected most of the other troops from a round of shooting. Then, what happens next? Well, you can see the action shots. And the vortex at the start of the next turn moves again. So yeah, I didn't do a huge amount of shooting damage, but got rid of some chaffs, chaff units, and killed a Chaos Ogre. Did some more wounds elsewhere. Honest Wargamer, painting is lame. Painting is not lame. Come on. It's probably, I would say for most people in the hobby, painting takes up significantly more time than gaming does. Those of us who, of course, embrace the slap chop way of life, which I know Rob is amongst those, I would say his painting probably takes up... Actually, you know what? I'm going to be fair. He actually, I saw him at the tournament. He was doing quite a bit of painting while TOing the event. So... I'll give him some credit there, but I'm sure he doesn't spend a vast amount of time in it because I know he despises painting. For me, it takes me about a week on and off to do, like, a unit. You need, like, 20 dwarves, 
I'm really working hard, I can get them out in a week. So, what are the evil, vile, disgusting forces of unpainted chaos doing in this round? Oaken Shield goes up again, and I... Have, you have a fated dispel you can use each round, regardless of whether your actual dispel wizards are in range. And I think, you know what, I'm probably not even going to kill these Dragon Ogres and Sorcerer. That's too tough a unit, so I don't really care if they have a ward save, because I'm going to be killing the more achievable stuff. And this is actually something to consider. If you've got a really tough, strong, powerful unit that your opponent feels like they're probably not going to kill by the end of the game, they might not bother attacking it at all. So, buffing it up might be redundant. So that's something to consider. How juicy is a particular target? So, for instance, these Warhounds, I'm not suggesting that you should put Oaken Shield on the Warhounds necessarily, but they are a very juicy target of just something to kill to get kill points. I don't think this is particularly juicy with the weapons I have at my disposal. So I probably wouldn't target them regardless of whether they had a ward save or not, because I just want to clear off other things, and they've got a lot of wounds to get through first. And the chances of me finishing them off if I get them down to, like, two models over there is very slim, because I would have to chase them and I'm not going to catch them. They could quite easily hide from my war machines. So, just little nuances to think about. You can see here that a wound is put on here with the stand and shoot, and then I think they fail their charge as well into the quarrelers, which is nice, so I've got one more round of attacking them. The Chaos Ogres on this side and the Warriors do make it into the Rangers, unfortunately. And I've got them in skirmish formation, which means that... Uh, when you're in combat, you rank up as wide as you can go so everyone is touching, and then you just put all the other models behind those models in the front rank. So you don't have a fighting rank as such, but you can also put them in open order, which means you would get ranks and you wouldn't have to obey any of those weird skirmish rules. But you're also not minus one to hit with shooting and your movement is more restricted. So, there is the state of play. Not much combat yet, but this one is going to be painful. Lots of chaos damage coming in. And this guy, this Dragon Ogre, decides, you know what, I'm not going to charge anyone. If I charge the Iron Drakes, they will certainly kill me and take this final, I think it's the final wound. So instead, I'm just going to march down here and sit in front of the Thunderers. So when I charge them, they can't shoot, stand and shoot against me. So, valid strategy. So, we get to the rest of the movement and everyone else is closing in. So it's getting tasty. The Hammerers do have a charge target now, so that's going to be interesting for them. Whether they could physically get there is another thing. The Iron Drakes probably would have to be out of the way, which you can't do before charges. But of course, the Hammerers can uh, do a, a bit of a redressing of the ranks before they charge. So we'll see. Then. What is going on here? You can see that the... Vortex has gone away. Has it totally disappeared? No, it's still there. So, there is some damage being dished out to this unit. Every time the Vortex goes past, you can see a couple of wounds being done. And I think this is my three dice dispel, because the wizard did come into range of my Rune Lord now. I think it was the Demon Prince. So, with a spellcaster that's also very fighty, having a really slow or static dispel unit, like the Anvil, or this Rune Lord, they have to weigh up in their mind, do they go forward into your dispel range so that they can fight, or do they stay out of it and just throw spells at you? On this occasion, he's come in, and as a result, I then roll the double one on the dispel. Now, it doesn't state if all the dice for the dispel roll a double one, it's just if a double one is rolled. So making a three dice dispel attempt is actually a riskier way of getting a double one, and he does take a wound as a result of it. So... It's like a, a Dispel miscast. And the Rangers are killed in combat, and both these units overrun off the table, which means I can't shoot them next turn, but when they come on, they can't charge as well. So that's alright, and I did kill one Chaos Warrior as well. I can kind of live with that, so I've taken those two out for a turn, but the Rangers are dead. Now then, what's my plan from here? The Hammerers want to get into combat, so they might... They might do it this turn, let's find out. Other than that, I'm going to have to start blasting away at these guys to get some of these numbers thinned out. Tomb King, Tristan, that's a personal attack if ever I saw one. 
Uh, well, that depends which comment you're referring to. So, turn two for the dwarves. I cannot stop this vortex, sadly. I think the wizard's still, st still too far away, so it moves again and does some more damage, which is sad. And yeah, there we go, look at that, they're reducing the numbers. So why do the Chaos Warriors even need to attack? They just drop a vortex, just float it back and forth across the Iron Breakers, and my one dispelling wizard is struggling to get there. And doing some shooting, can't kill an ogre, unfortunately. My engineer has moved out in front, just in case they charge into the quarrelers, then they would overrun into him and not the war machines. See, on this, Rogue Hobby's birthday, you come for painting. That is, yeah, if you're referring to the honest wargamer's comment that painting is lame, I'm sure Rogue Hobbies would take issue with that as the pro, top-notch, top-tier painter of the community. So I just totally miss with the Grudge Thrower, and I'm getting kind of disillusioned with these two war machines already. They're repeatedly missing. And the Iron Drakes, look at that, down to three Chaos Warriors, so that's a really good round of shooting. And then if they want to charge me now and eat a stand and shoot, maybe could finish them off. Now, one thing that's interesting, the Trollhammer Torpedo. In some of the practice games, because of the... I'm going to blame the Old World Builder app now. So, the way that's laid out... I kind of misread that the Trollhammer Torpedo does not actually also have some of the same rules as the Drake Guns. So, the Trollhammer Torpedo cannot stand and shoot from point-blank range, and it does have minus one for moving. So, it's still really good, and you still not... you still got Ballistic Skill 5 on the Champion as well, so it's still really good. It's just not as ridiculous as I first thought. But these four guys can still just stand and shoot even if you're an inch away from them, so that's still really good. And yeah, the Old World Builder app actually caused me to make a list building error at the tournament this weekend, which you'll hear all about in that video. So I played an illegal list for day one of that event. Then you can see that there is not much being done with the shooting into this guy. He's still alive, which is very sad indeed. I have rallied these warriors. And I think the hammerers, if anything, I don't know if they move back, maybe the Iron Drakes move forward. The hammerers are ready if anyone wants to charge them. If the dogs want to come in, I would just kill them on the Chaos turn, which is ideal, because then they can do something else on my turn. So, it's an interesting situation. Whenever there's combat going on, if one unit is likely to be wiped out, whose turn is it next? Something to consider. So if you're holding up a big monster with a, a big unit, half of them die, and you think, yes, I've held it up for a turn but then it's your turn next. So that means the monster can actually uh, stay in combat with you, not be shot because it's in combat, and then it can finish off the unit on your turn and then be free to charge on its turn. So sometimes you do want your own units to be killed quicker under those circumstances. On to turn three for Chaos. So you can see nothing significant was done shooting-wise apart from this unit being heavily whittled down. So, moving on to turn three for Chaos. And what's this? A double six. I'm going to assume that's for a pair of armor saves for the Iron Breakers. Keeps them alive. So, there we go. Curse of Cowardly Flight is then cast, which is the Panic Test spell. And it's very scary, actually. I don't know what these Ranger corpses are doing there. Oh, this is the dead pile. This is in the corner, actually. So, the Quarrelers, I think, fail their test as a result of this spell, and they run away off the table. So the one time dwarves are actually fast is when they're fleeing from a spell that's not even an enemy. It's just, what's the, the fluff text on here? Battle Mage reaches into the minds of the enemy, tapping into their fears and weakening their intestinal fortitude. So, what would be a fear for a dwarf? What would, You tap into their mind, what images are you planting into their minds to cause them to flee the battlefield? Like watered down ale, perhaps. And that causes them to just run all the way home to check that there isn't someone secretly diluting their beer supply. That's what I'm going to go with. So the Quarrelers just flee from battle, despite being on leadership 9, 10 if the, 
the king was in range. The Iron Drakes do murder the final three Chaos Warriors with stand and shoot, as expected. And this army is painted now, apparently, almost. You must have slapped the chop out of this thing to get it done that fast. But that is, is some impressive work. There are some things I can paint very fast, actually. Ghosts, because that's just a lot of dry brushing and shades. So ghosts are very quick to paint. And actually, big scaly monsters as well, because there's a lot of dry brushing that goes into those. So they're done very fast. These really old dwarves with like 10 different pouches and different mechanical gizmos on their belts, they take an age to paint. The doggos decide they're going to charge into the iron drakes as well in the flank, so we'll see if that's enough to take down these sturdy dwarven tunnel warriors who've just killed a Warriors of Chaos unit. And these ones take advantage of the fact that the quarrelers ran away and just charge into the engineer, so if they kill him they'll overrun into the bolt thrower. Let's see, Ben C says if you use the speed paint metallics you can paint an iron drake in approximately two seconds. That's probably true, but I I wouldn't say I refuse to paint with like speed paint or contrasts as the final layer of paint. But generally I use it on as a base coat and then highlight up from there. There's very few models where I've applied it first. They're really these quick, a thin like super washes and then thought, yes, that looks good enough to put straight onto the table. Very rare that I have felt that way. So I always end up painting on top of it as well. So, the two dogs, wildly, I think they only have about leadership four, these little mutts, but they do rally and they go and hide behind this bit of terrain because that's just denying me points now, because you have to kill the whole unit, or at least get them to below 25% to get some points as well. And you can see this vortex is still hanging out. Do I hate speed and that's why you play dwarves? Well... There could be something in that, because my main army in Kings of War is the Abyssal Dwarves, who are also very slow. So you could be onto something. I'm just going to glance over at my cabinet. Okay, I'm not sure it's entirely valid, because Age of Sigmar, I've got my Stormcast Eternals, who, would you consider it speed if they can just zap down onto the table wherever they feel like? Maybe. That's a kind of speed, isn't it? But then once they're there, they're usually not very fast. Yeah, so maybe. Maybe I have something against speed. Maybe I judge people if I turn up to the table and I see nothing but really fast flyers. Whatever game system it is. We're down to this final dwarf warrior here, who the Vortex has hit multiple times. And he is still alive. The Gyrocopter, you can see, who went up there to do some shooting previously. These two units have come back onto the table now, so I'm going to get one go at shooting them with these quarrelers. Now, because these quarrelers couldn't actually shoot anything in the previous turn, because these guys were off the table running down the rangers, I could have actually moved them backwards. So if you've got nothing to do with a shooting unit in a turn, why not spend a turn repositioning them a bit? And that would be slightly further from the enemy, so they're going to have a slightly longer charge. And, wow, these are the saves for this guy. He lives. He had five armor saves to make on a four-up. And he does it. That is amazing. This guy is the MVP so far. Dwarf turns are very fast because you get no magic and you have very rarely have any movement. So my turns are typically very fast. The shooting phase takes a bit longer, but it's still just dice rolling. You're not having to angle troops very much. So look at this guy. He's showing the Iron Breakers how to survive here. Then, Thunderers are being killed by this Dragon Ogre who they failed to kill in the previous turn. They couldn't do one more pesky wound to him. And they don't flee though, so that's good. And the Iron Drakes, I think the Iron Drakes maybe tie the combat here, but then win because they're in close order, so they're then able to follow up into the Doggos. And the Chaos Warriors fighting the Engineer. And I think there may have been a challenge involved here, which is why he only takes a single wound and isn't dead immediately. So if you want to live longer, challenge someone. So, lots of combat going on now, and the Vortex, yet again, is moving through the Iron Breakers. 
And what's this? Hammerers committing murder. So if we look down here, the hammerers are primed for a flank charge into the doggos. So obviously that's just a complete massacre. And now the hammerers are poised, ready to strike at the heart of the enemy's army. And by heart, I mean these chaos ogres that are too far away to charge. The gyrocopter has moved over there and takes some shots at them, but it's not doing much. So the clatter gun is really good in theory because you can march and shoot, but it's also, at best, you're hitting on fives with it. And it's d6 shots, so usually that means one shot. So maybe I would be better off with a template and just moving nine before I drop it. So what else is being accomplished here? Not a lot. The war machines are still failing at every turn and not doing enough killing for my liking. So into the Warriors of Chaos turn again. Charging war machines. I've got to agree with you there. That is disgraceful behavior. Charging war machines, it should be banned, I think, because they can't stand and shoot. So how is it fair exactly? Charging into this poor defenseless war machine crew, at least have the sportsmanship to attack from range so it's got toughness 7. I think that would make it a fair sporting thing to do. So yeah, I'm going to start marking people down on sportsmanship, I think, if they charge the war machines. That's a very good point, Wes. So the ward save is up on the dragon ogres again. The chaos ogres, or chogers as they may be known, have moved into the quarrelers there. And... The final Thunderer against a Dragon Ogre. That's not going to end well for him. And my little dwarf screen unit that ran away earlier in the game and finally moved their way back up, get hit by the Chaos Ogres. And let's see if this Engineer can survive. So the Demon Prince, you might notice, has been zapping around. I think he used a movement spell to get into a really scary position now. And he's now staring into the flank. And because I'm not... I think... Do you have to be... I think you have to be within the wizard's arc of sight for them to dispel. So now he's out of it. And this vortex is playing havoc. And look, that the final dwarf warrior from that unit 5 who is lurking there is finally murdered. So he's dead. We've got two vortexes now because one obviously wasn't enough. So why not drop two vortexes? One of which can't be dispelled because the caster is here and my rune lord is there who's not looking at him. And he has no peripheral vision because of his silly dwarven helmet with those big horns on it. So, moving on. Quarrelers are getting quarrelled, but that looks like a good break test result there, so they're hanging in there. The Hammerers have now got a juicy charge onto these Chaos Ogres, who killed the remaining warriors in that unit. And the Engineer, still alive, crazy and that also means that these chaos ogres are stuck because they can't charge anything because this unit's in the way on the hill which means they can't see over the unit to declare a charge into the engineer or the bolt thrower which is hilarious so they're now having to turn around and go back because these guys are technically on the hill they just wouldn't balance on there because as you know rob doesn't like hills very much in fact you might say he despises hills and it probably caused him severe pain to create these ones for his venue I think having to bring hills into the TSN, what would you compare it to? It's like when a, one, a politician leaves one political party and then joins one, joins another one that's kind of ideologically the opposite to that party. And they kind of have to accept them in because it gives them better numbers in the, the ratio of politicians. So it, it still brings them great pain though. So that's what I'm feeling here. Rob bringing hills in, but he's... Still got some seething hatred towards them. Right, let's see what the dwarves can do about this. He loves hills, hates hills, but loves vortexes. I think that is a fair assessment of Rob. So turn four for the dwarves. What are we going to do here? The iron breakers are stuck behind two vortices, so there's not much they can do. My war machines can still shoot, which means nothing because they're hopeless and can't hit anything. The gyrocopter has it a gun that's also useless, so I don't know what that's going to do. But the Iron Drakes are still up, so they're fine. The Hammerers are going to be able to hit these Chaos Ogres as well. So, you'll see that the Vortex actually moves there and the Demon Prince is hanging out behind now. So yeah, that happened at the end of the previous turn, I just got extra pictures of it now. So the Hammerers make it into the Chaos Ogres, so they're going to totally womp them to death hopefully. Uh, the Iron Drakes turn around and scorch the Dragon Ogre to death after he killed all the Thunderers. 
and my gyrocopter in this lovely upside down picture is trying to use its clutter gun on these doggos that are hiding but doesn't hit them because it's garbage. And two upside down pictures in a row, you know I go through these pictures beforehand and turn them all round so they're all correct, but obviously miss these two. And the engineer is still hanging in there against the Chaos Warrior Champion, which is nice. A grudge thrower hits nothing, so a picture of the template over the floor, the traditional way of signifying that you've hit nothing. And a Chaos Ogre is killed by something else, though. Uh, no, actually, yeah, I think he's the last one in this unit, just hanging out in the corner. So he's gone off to hide over there. These ones flee from the hammerers after the hammerers win the combat, and I don't catch them, but I do go into the difficult terrain. And <laughs> this fight's still going on. The engineer will not die. And he's not the easiest guy to kill, actually, because he's half-decent weapon skill, obviously Toughness 4th being a dwarf, and I think he's got heavy armour, the engineer. So yeah, you should be killing him, really. If you can roll dice, you should be killing an engineer. So turn 5 for the Warriors of Chaos, and it's not looking good for the dwarves, but I've still got lots of very expensive units left. These two units are where most of my points are lurking. So we've got, finally, some combat the Dragon Ogres and the Iron Breakers. We'll see who reigns supreme there. And then, oh no, we won't, because they've got a Demon Prince in the rear and Chaos Ogres in the flank. So I think we know how that's going to go now. Unfortunately. So the Demon Prince was able to wrangle his way all the way around with various movement and teleporting and such. It's not really a teleport, is it? It's just an extra movement, but since he can fly, he can then go bloop, bloop, bloop. And now he's got a rear charge. And what else can the Iron Breakers do other than get charged by someone? The dogs are hiding from the gyrocopter. The Chaos Warriors are hiding from the Iron Drakes, which is hilarious, and so is the Chaos Ogre. So they're going to be dancing around this bit of terrain trying to protect their points from the Iron Drakes, because really, what are you going to achieve in this position? You're going to walk towards the Iron Drakes, get shot, charge them, a stand and shoot, that probably kills you. So why would you do that when you can just hide and not lose points? So. The Engineer appears to have killed the Chaos Champion. Which is actually terrible news for the Engineer, because that means there's no one left for him to challenge, so in the next round, everyone's going to be able to attack him. So you'd think the Chaos Warriors were just like standing there, tapping their watches, thinking, are you going to kill this guy or what? And then maybe they like stuck a knife in the Champion's back to get it over with, so they're allowed to fight as well. My Dwarf King is in a challenge with the Demon Prince, and my opponents never see the amount of time I took highlighting the Dwarf King's grey to white hair gradient, because he's always facing towards them. So we'll take a moment to appreciate that right now. And wounds being dished out left and right, Iron Breakers being slaughtered, and yeah, they're all dead. So they get run down, killed, but the Hammerers are in position to strike now, so they can maybe kill something, which would be good. And, yeah, the issue I'm finding with the Hammerers and the Iron Breakers, if you take them as two, that's a lot of your points, so you're giving up on some of your shooting power. And those are two extremely slow, easy to avoid units. If the enemy doesn't want to engage you, then why should they? They don't have to. You're so slow, they can easily stay away from you. In fact, unless they actively go towards you, on average, you'll probably never reach them. So, you need to tempt them into coming into range and I don't feel like having those two decent combat units is enough of a temptation to bring the enemy close to them. Maybe a smaller unit would be more tempting or maybe you need a really tempting screen in front of them. So for example if I used the rangers in front of my main line and I was firing off loads of crossbows maybe someone would want to charge them and thus come into range of the hammerers. Now the iron drakes kind of had that role in mind but the right flank ended up collapsing a bit and they've had to divert their attention elsewhere. So the engineer is finally killed now that the champion has stopped messing about and let his friends kill him and they overrun into the bolt thrower. So turn five for the dwarves. The hammerers are going to charge at the grudge thrower. What's that? It actually hit, lands a hit somewhere. Uh, it does a bit, little bit of damage actually. I think it was a direct hit onto these chaos ogres. So that guy might be dead now. The Hammerers do charge in and kill the other unit of Chaos Ogres, which is great, and the Iron Drakes do a bit of damage with their shooting as well, but not much. They're not even bothering chasing after the guys behind this building, because I'm not going to catch them. 
You can see the gyrocopter has come round and missed with its clatter gun again into the dogs. So yeah, the clatter gun, it was really good in theory, but I think it's actually complete garbage. So the hammerers have now angled themselves in this sort of direction, so everyone's going to be charging them in the front. And we'll see how that goes. The bolt thrower is killed in combat over on into the grudge thrower. I'm not very happy with the performance of these two war machines. So going into the tournament, I do drastically change my list war machine wise. And I'm not very happy with the rune lord either. He's very easy to avoid with his small dispel range. And it's not been much use for me in this game. So yeah, not much accomplished other than murdering that unit there. And one of these guys I think got killed as well. Turn six, the final turn for the forces of chaos. The vile, evil, disgusting, somewhat painted forces of chaos. Everyone slams into the hammerers except the demon prince. And these guys are going to hope to finish off the grudge thrower. And they don't. So they've got it down to one crew member. And that is the outcome of all those combats. And turn six for the dwarves. So it's going very rapidly now. The gyrocopter tries to charge the warhounds, but does not do it. Now, they fled, so if I'd caught them, they'd be dead. And at this point, it was after the game I realised, actually, you know what, this gyrocopter has swift stride. Because I haven't really been charging anyone with it from far away, so I haven't needed it yet. But he does have swift stride, so he could have actually caught them and killed them, so that could have got me a few more points. The Iron Drakes do a bit of shooting at something, I think the Demon Prince, but don't really do much because he's been racking up on his stats over the course of the game with the Eye of the Gods. And the favour of the Gods certainly blessed him because he gained some toughness over the course of the game, which is nice. Ben says, have you tried the Flame Cannon yet? Doesn't seem like it would be good with everyone playing Line Hammer. Everything except the Cannon Organ Gun doesn't seem great. Yes. So the Bolt Thrower looked really good on paper going into this old world. But people aren't running lots of lots of ranks particularly at the moment, at least on the kind of units you would want to shoot with the bolt thrower. So that's the downfall for the bolt thrower. So it doesn't hit very often, and when it does, you don't really have the great, uh, great ideal target for it. The cannon has a nice range and you can hit multiple different units with it, so potentially good. I like the organ gun just because it has a lot of shots, and it's also very unlikely to fully misfire which I like. So the organ guns might be my favourite at the moment, even though a lot of people think they're horrible and overcosted. I do like them. So the hammerers end up getting annihilated by all this, this chaotic meat. Just look at all that, it's so meaty. And the hammerers just got tenderised. How ironic's that, the meat tenderising the hammers. Remington Steel is in the chat. Hello there, Mr. Remington. Yeah, so I hope your wood elves are ready for some more battling action. So that will be the end of the game. So the Iron Drake survives, the Gyrocopter survives, lots of the Chaos stuff survives. Most of them are hiding or running away. But this batch of expensive stuff in the middle has been pretty much untouched for the whole game. One of these guys has died, but that's about it. So where did that go wrong? I don't feel like my shooting was particularly effective. I think the two war machines I chose weren't up to the job. I don't think these were two good targets for those two war machines in particular. The Grudge Thrower really wants massive blocks of troops, so if it scatters it still hits loads of them. And the Bolt Thrower wants several ranks of high armour troops to punch through. And none of those things were present here. So... I'll talk about what I think about the Rune Lord. Don't like him. I think his dispel range isn't long enough and he's expensive. So I think the Rune Smith gives you much of the similar abilities as the Rune Lord, but is a lot cheaper. And I think the Anvil of Doom is just the way to go. 24 inch range. The enemy can still dictate whether they walk into that 24 inch range or not, but if they're a level 4, there is no sweet spot for them where they can dispel your spells but you can't dispel theirs so if they come into range they can dispel you but you can also dispel them if they want to stay back casting that's okay because lots of the spells have limited ranges so they're going to be limited where they can cast them and also you're free to just strike all your runes with no one around to dispel it so i do like the anvil even though it has some limitations i i like the little unit of five dwarf warriors i don't know about running multiples of them 
but I do like one because it's only 40 points and it's a nice little screen and they're not the easiest thing to get through, just any dwarf unit really because they're all toughness four. So I quite like that as a unit. So one of those may go into my tournament list. The BSB giving a ward save to the hammerers I found very useful. So I think he is probably going to stay in there doing that job. And what else? The king, who was in the Ironbreakers, didn't really get to do anything. It makes the unit so expensive, because that king with all the upgrades is 234 points. The Ironbreaker unit is 231. So that's near enough 500 points, almost, in a unit. And actually, more than that, because the Rune Lord was also in there. So it's like 650 points in a unit that the enemy can easily ignore, because it's only movement 3. So I think the combat king, not necessarily the way to go, now, if you are talking the shield bearer king, that might be a different matter because he's also expensive, more expensive, but he gets more wounds and makes him nice and survivable. I think it's mainly just the two combat unit issue I'm having with this list. I don't feel I can squeeze enough shooting in. So I do change things up for the tournament and I go down to one fighty unit of hammerers with the BSB in there and then everything else has some kind of shooting capability for the most part. So when I do my tournament report, you'll see that. So that will be tomorrow evening on this channel. And that's going to be five games of Old World reported on in intimate detail. And in fact, I'll give you a sneak preview of the list I use now. I'll give you a few nuggets from it. So let's have a look. So the Anvil of Doom is back, baby. Anvil of Doom is in there, upgraded with some extra spelling stuff. I have gone for two units of Iron Drakes, because they're just great, the Trollhammer Torpedo is really good. I've gone for double organ gun, and backed up by an engineer with a handgun, so we can actually help with the shooting. So those are the main changes to the list. Uh, the other war machines have come out of the list. I have changed up my Quarreler Ranger ratio a bit, so you'll see that in action as well. And there's room for a Dragon Slayer as well, so you'll see if he gets anything done at the tournament. So, uh, as another little sneak preview, preview, I can tell you some of the factions I played against at the tournament as well. So, my games included Dwarves vs Chaos Warriors, Dwarves vs High Elves, Dwarves vs Dwarves, isn't that just wild indeed? And dwarves versus orcs and goblins. What? What? Wow! Ancient hatred brewing on both sides in that one. Yes, a dwarf civil war. Although the dwarf list is quite different to the one I take to the tournament, as you'll see tomorrow evening. So it's time to wrap up this delightful battle report and. You can see, look how happy Rob is to be putting out his grotesquely unpainted army in a battle report. Look at him. He's so satisfied with himself, isn't he? Thinking, yes, that resin, that naked resin, is going to just drag down Andy's channel into the mud. What's the name of that Citadel paint? That's mud. It's got the word mud in it. Someone let me know. And, no, I can't believe he'd even show his face. Well, he almost didn't. He's trying to hide it as much as possible by closing his eyes. But that doesn't work. As you find out in childhood. Sterland mud, that's the one. So he's dragging this channel down into the Sterland mud with his naked resin. And I'm not even going to say poor base painting because they're just not painted at all. So maybe he's, he's got them looking really nice by now. So we'll see. I'm sure we'll have more games in the future. So fully painted. That's a guarantee. Now, before we wrap this one up, don't forget to check out all the links in the description. Don't forget to like and subscribe and all that good stuff if you haven't already for some weird reason. Don't forget to check out the Twitter, Discord, Facebook. All that stuff is down there. And obviously, if you want this channel to continue to be a beacon of light in these dark, murky wargaming times, you want to see endless, non-stop battle reports and tournament reports for a variety of different game systems, heavily featuring the old world at the moment because it's the new hotness, 
and everyone's still learning the rules, so you've got to play a million games to get all those very complicated and strange rules drilled into your brain, then why not pledge your entire life savings via the Patreon, which is linked down below, or PayPal. So yeah, I'd accept your life savings. I would reluctantly accept a small wedge of the life savings, but if you can pledge them all, that would be very helpful, and that will pay for me to attend a lot more tournaments, so that I can continue to keep this content flow bursting through the internet towards your senses, keeping you entertained and educated, tactically informed, and hopefully you've got something very useful out of this video, because I'm not sure I have. I have, really. I've got that the runesmith, uh, the rune lord I don't like, most important thing, and the war machines I didn't like either. Those were the three nuggets I took away. Here's one for the comments. How about this to drive some engagement? What's your info nugget of the video? What's the one nugget you can take away? You've been in the stream of this content with your little pan, and you've been filtering out all the, the sterling mud. What's the shiny nugget of wisdom that you found in there? Ben Seath, thanks for the battle report. Appreciation from the old world community. Well, thank you for watching. And all that remains to be said at this point is... Good night out there. Whatever you are.